Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Shaffrey, and I was the uh, president of the AANS in 2020. And I want to thank John Wilson and the AANS for their extreme generosity for this Best of Boston session, where we could uh, show some of the amazing talents and honor uh, some of the award recipients from, uh, from that meeting. So uh, we will get the slides up and get started. So the topic for my, my meeting was the world of neurosurgery. And the world of uh, 2019 and 2020 have changed substantially compared to what it was in those, in those days. And what has happened when I was uh, doing my meeting, I wanted to feel that there was a real community amongst neurosurgeons for training, for education. And there was a special bond that existed between the neurosurgeons throughout the world. And my uh, initial talk that I had put together talked about ways to improve interconnectedness throughout the neurosurgery community throughout the world. And I was talking about things like virtual meetings and Zoom meetings and things like that. And at that time, I thought it sounded novel and cutting edge. And after uh, several years of the, of, of, the, of the COVID pandemic, I think the, the novelness of us having multiple Zoom meetings a, a, a week or a month is something that is uh, probably more tiresome than fun and cutting edge. But as I started to think about why the importantness, the importance of interconnectedness existed, it was because that the world is changing. And, and what's happening is I think that the realization that, uh, that, that how one thing impacts everyone else is increasingly important. And this shows the cumulative cases of COVID throughout the world over time and shows that there's not a country, there's not a continent that has not been impacted by this uh, horrible pandemic. But with this, uh, there's been also divisions. And I think that at least in, in my lifetime, you probably would have to go back to when I was a child during Vietnam to have the type of divisiveness that is present now. And what's happening, and it's easy to become divided in this world of the pandemic, this uh, divisiveness is, is, fairly, uh, is fairly substantial. And you can even see this looks at the vaccination rates across the United States. And you would think there would be not much of a question that with a horrible disease rate uh, raging throughout the world, if we have an opportunity for vaccination, it'd be something that we'd, we'd be strongly considering, and it wouldn't be a topic for political discussion. Now, this is actually a, a picture of Belarus, and I didn't want to show a picture from, you know, from the United States because it might show that I have some type of political bias as far as things are concerned. The fact is the world right now is a tense place, and there are a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, 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 strong feelings going on throughout the world. And I just think that uh, you're going to see for the rest of my talk that we in neurosurgeons have something special and that, that which should be unifying us together in a common community rather than leading to further divisiveness. So what is neurosurgery? And one of the things about it is that it's such a broad, uh, broad field. When we talk about diseases and disorders of the brain, spinal cord, spinal column, peripheral nerves, and includes pediatric patients, adult patients, cerebrovascular system, spinal column. There's almost no area of medicine that is so broad and touches so many patients' uh, patients' lives. And one of the things which you hear for neurosurgery, and I think when we listened to Hunt speak earlier and Jacques Marco speak earlier, I think that we feel that we do something that is truly unique. And I think one of the, the, the unique aspects of neurosurgeons is we don't consider what we do a job. A job is something that has its own importance. It's, it, it's, it's daily work, and it's a way to in, earn an income. But what a vocation is, and I think most of us feel our, uh, our involvement in neurosurgery is a vocation. It evokes our innermost gifts, our abilities, our passions, our dreams, and serves a broader life purpose than what any job or any singular career. And the, and the word, uh, word vocation, the root word is uh, vo vocationum, which means a calling. And a vocation is an occupation that someone feels strongly about doing despite monetary gain or other influences. And I certainly think that for most people in neurosurgery, that is the case. And we look at some of the people that spoke today, 
would any of them be anything but a vacation for them? These are people that are driven to a calling who have made enormous contributions to society because of their, their drive, focus, and sacrifice to make that happen. So how do you find a vocation? And one of the things is, one of my pleasures is the ability to uh, work with medical students and, and, and residents. And when you sit there and you talk to people that are applying for a neurosurgery residency, so many of them have said, look, at this has been something that has been in the back of my mind since I was a child. And one of the things about how to find a vocation, and you find this almost uniquely in neurosurgery compared to other areas, is that these are people that have had passions and talents that they've noticed through, through the years. And, and these are things that inherently involve activities that they enjoy and that they are very personally centric to, to, to their lives. And one of the things is that most people wanna make an enormous difference where you can go and have the most significant difference in someone's life using your own gifts and abilities. And I think that is singularly uh, uh, special in most people who have gone into the career of neurosurgery. I think it allows a growth and development, allows you to change through the years to be able to go and to obtain new skills and, and, and new areas of, uh, of influence and how to further contribute to impacting your community and the people that surround you. So, uh, so Aaron Cohen-Gadal has this wonderful neurosurgical atlas, and uh, and I had it on my desk, and I was flipping through it uh, a couple of years ago, and I saw that he has a, a section talking about I am interested in neurosurgery, but everybody keeps on telling me not to do it, and it is it is a uh, it is a, a a a field that requires intensity. Of, uh, of effort, study, and, and some sacrifice. And I think that it was distilled very nicely by Aaron when he talks about the advantages of neurosurgery is the chance to help the sickest patients in the hospital who have devastating neurological diseases. It involves technical ch technically challenging operations on fascinating and complex anatomy. It involves uh, in interacting with motivated and passionate colleagues. It has endless research activities, but there's a price, and the price is a long and extensive training path long hours, call schedules that are often inflexible that impact uh, relationships. And there are potential personal sacrifices in terms of family and hobbies and other things that certainly can occur. And then there's also the emotional discomfort associated with witnessing the suffering of these incredibly sick patients. So you look at this and it just, it's, it's almost a miracle and you know, we saw in some of the, the, the great talks we heard earlier, for example, that Jacques showed us just absolutely masterful things that something that 100 years ago would have been universally fatal, that we have the technical ability through our training and acquisition of skills to treat these uh, what used to be universally uh, fatal diseases. Now, what's happening is I think one of the aspects of it, and this is a special forces unit, and what happens is when you go through extraordinarily difficult training, you do things. I think this is why the bonding, if you talk to people that were special forces operators, that they have bonds that last for years after, uh, years after their, their, their time and work. And it's because this training, this sense of unity, the sense of community is, uh, is, is, so, is so important. Now, neurosurgery is a very, very diverse field. And you can see the sort of the breakdown of, 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 of cases. This was done in the 2014, 2015 uh, uh, time period. But you can see there are so many different uh, subspecialty areas that encompass neurosurgery. And one of the things I'm going to talk about over the next few minutes is how my own personal growth and development has had a kind of a real uh, epiphany as far as the importance of neurosurgery as a, as a complete community. So one of the things is, this is a case that I did a couple of weeks ago, and is this something that has traditionally been seen as a neurosurgery case? And I certainly think as myself as a neurosurgeon, and this is a case I did, so I guess the short answer would be, would be, would be yes. But that's not always been the case. And one of the problems that other specialties have had, and I'm gonna show some examples of this, 
where they have fractured, where they have not held the belief that being, for example, a neurosurgeon is the single highest calling for you has resulted in extreme difficulty for a number of other medical specialties. And it was only due to the forethought of some of my predecessors that, that this has not happened to neurosurgery. So when I, was, when I had made my decision that I was going to do two residencies, that decision wasn't, was only because at the University of Virginia at that time, cases were done, any case that required any type of spinal instrumentation or fusion, that the orthopedic team was brought in. And at that time, there was an extremely close relationship between John Jane and the chair of orthopedics, and they did cases together. And I just thought to myself, boy, if I could do, if I could know all of this, I would have a unique skill set. So I'm, I'm partially through my residency, and Dr. Ranzahov gives a gives a talk at the Senior Society, which happened to be in Charlottesville, and and basically his 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 plea was that neurosurgery should revert to only treating things within the arachnoid. And part of his talk was academic and spine surgery is an oxymoron. No self-respecting neurosurgeon would ever focus their careers in that area. Spine surgery should be left to those who are either too stupid or too technically inept to do anything else in neurosurgery. And I was kind of sitting there in the audience wondering what I may have gotten myself, uh, gotten myself into. Well, one of the things that around that time, slightly before, uh, Dr. Roten, who we've heard his name mentioned so many times through the talks today, when he was uh, when when he was the uh, the president of the WNS, as you see here, he said, "I experienced a gnawing discomfort that intracranial surgery is overshadowed spinal neurosurgery," and he and he says he says that his goal was to give more dignity to spinal surgery, to install a sense of importance of spinal surgery within our specialty, and to stimulate subspecialization in spine surgery. And he wanted to strengthen research, educational programs, and he goes, spine surgery has been taken for granted. And, and he, together with, with Dr. Drake and Dr. Kelly, were, 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 were foundational in the form, formation of the joint spine section. So uh, with, uh, with Stuart Dunsker and, and Sandy Larson, they were the initial uh, co-chairs of the spine committee, which ended up becoming the spine section. And what happens is that there have been some incredible uh, leaders that have developed. But when you look back to the 1980s, only 4% of the articles in Journal of Neurosurgery and only 6% in neurosurgery were on spine-related topics. And the vast majority of them came from Charles Tatter's lab and eventually with Michael Phelan's. And so what had happened was that there was this, this feeling that spine surgery wasn't integral to neurosurgery. Academically, there were real concerns. And as far as publications, it was, it was, uh, it was an area that, uh, that they were certainly lagging behind uh, some of our orthopedic colleagues. Once the, uh, once the, the, the joint spine section started, there were incredible leaders, Volker Suntag, Ed Benzel, and others, who really began to increase both the academic aspect of spine surgery, the fellowship aspect of spine surgery. And I will tell you, for me as a, as a young surgeon, the first couple uh, joint section meetings were, hey, should spine neurosurgeons pull out of neurosurgery as a whole and form their own specialty with orthopedic spine surgeons? And again, it was things like Dr. Roten, who really would, would, was, was very engaged. And I remember as an as a, as a, as a early surgeon, having Dr. Roten come to the joint spine section meeting just to make a trip there, to sit there with us. And all the times during the, the AANS meetings, when we had uh, you know, breakfast or lunch and seminars, would come and sit with the spine surgeons to say, hey, look at we want you to be part of us. And, 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 and that was a unique and very refreshing attitude to be held at that time. So people like Paul McCormick and Dave Cahill, you know, Dave, you know, you can see here about correction of adult scoliosis from the early 1990s, who really went and reshaped what it meant to be uh, a, a spinal neurosurgeon. And I think that, that neurosurgery has led the world for, uh, for, uh, 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 led the world in, in minimally invasive techniques and, and is really uh, the new innovations in spine surgery are directly uh, traceable to the lineage of, uh, of, 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 Kevin, uh, of Kevin and others. 
So what's happening is right around that same time, you know, when I was a resident, uh, uh, John Jane had talked to me a number of occasions. And he said, you know, look at, you know, we they looked at the articles between 1944 and 1999. And of the 50 most highly cited, only one article was on a spine topic. And even in 1998, only 10% of the Journal of Neurosurgery was on spine-related publications. And so because of that, he had said, look at what do we do to change this? And I said, and we discussed it together. And I said, look at a, a separate journal where you have your own editorial board made up of completely of spine surgeons uh, would, would really go and induce people to, to, to move academically and to go and help mature the field of spinal neurosurgery. So John Jane uh, you know, uh, formed the uh, Journal of Neurosurgery Spine, and I think that the success of this has been enormous, and it's actually the journal of choice for many orthopedic spine surgeons due to its increasing impact factor and widespread visibility and relevance. So basically, you know, there were times, and this was, you know, people have called this attention to this. You know, this was an article for a, a kind of a thought exercise and said, look, it, is there, is there a, uh, a, a rationale for having kind of a spine residency, an integrated spine residency? And what had happened was, is that as neurosurgery training was getting longer and longer, and a number of the spine fellowships were moving from one to two years, it was an enormous, uh, enormous commitment to become a spine surgeon, particularly a spine surgeon doing complicated things like advanced minimally invasive techniques, uh, you know, spinal oncology, some spinal deformity things. And the fact is, when you're getting to eight and nine years of training, there is a real impact, uh, a real impact on that. So, uh, so these, this was sort of a thing how you could probably become a well-trained spine surgeon in six years. You know, and it's funny, even though I was involved in putting this together, it's something that I, again, as you're going to see, that through the thoughtfulness, particularly through the American Board of Neurological Surgery, this has been able to be achieved while maintaining the importance of us being neurosurgeons. So, Basically, so, so, so my world of neurosurgery talk is now why it's so important that we are able to be able to, to, to work together to, inc to increase the specialty of neurosurgery. And despite all the horrible things of the pandemic, one of the benefits are all these virtual grand rounds, virtual conferences, uh, you know, different types of meetings that we're doing on, uh, you know, on a weekly basis, and the opportunity to be educated, the opportunity to network, the opportunity to be engaged is never better than what it is, uh, what it is, what it is today. So what's happening is I think that one of the things where the AANS in particular has led the charge is the, is, is the Journal of Neurosurgery Publishing Group is just doing extraordinary things uh, in the world of education, uh, education. And I think some of these things like JNS case lessons where it allows people from all over the world to be actively engaged in publication, the journal club uh, efforts that have been uh, done for, uh, for impactful articles and all the different uh, subspecialty journals, all has been really, really important to go and have this interconnectedness, which is so important for us to maintain the integrity of our uh, specialty. Now, why should we? Why should we? Uh, why should we unite? Why should neurosurgery become first before all of our subspecialty interests? And what happens is probably the only field that that matches our breadth of pathology is the American Board of General Surgery. And what happens? You can see that it takes care of perioperative. Uh, post-operative management of patients from diseases which require, uh, you know, from, from, from top to bottom. And one of the, one of the issues uh, with this is that the, uh, the, the general surgery community is somewhat under, under siege right now. And so what's happening is, is that they say that to finish as a general neurosurgery resident, you should be able to be familiar uh, with uh, commission uh, conditions involving the alimentary tract, the abdomen and contest, the breast, skin, soft tissue. But they go on to say that to do things more advanced, uh, that you're going to require additional training. 
And that's going to be either in vascular surgery, pediatric surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, colorectal surgery, thoracic surgery, burn surgery, oncological surgery, plastic surgery. And if you go to your hospital, how many people say, I'm a general surgeon who specialized in cardiothoracic surgery? That's not the case. If you look at, look at them, most people, I'm a cardiothoracic surgery surgeon or I'm a colorectal surgeon, and their, their, their training, if they did general neurosurgery training, is far in the rear, uh, the rear window. And this has impacted you know, the, the, the specialty as a whole. This is an article saying general surgery and crisis factors that impact a career in general surgery. Uh, this is another article talking about surgeon's perspective, promoting and discouraging factors for choosing a career path in general surgery uh, by surgeons. And there have been some, some different things. And what they're seeing is, is that the best and brightest who used to go into general surgery are now going into other subspecialties. And it says here, US allopathic medical schools have been, uh, schools have been losing interest in general surgery for the past 40 years. And it says that, that, that this is becoming an increasingly uh, important uh, area for there. This is a study, uh, a recent study that looked at graduates uh, who matched into general surgery. And what they found was the current attrition rate of people who match into general surgery is 44%. And almost 50% of the graduates change to another surgical subspecialty. So people leave and are going off to do something, so, something else and not finishing in general surgery. And so there was a commission by the American College of Surgeons, and they felt the general surgery training was at a crossroads uh, that, uh, that in addition to having concerns about attracting people, things, uh, cons uh, aspects of the training are increasingly concerning. And they found that the failure rate on the American Board of Surgery certifying exam has increased by more than 50% over 10 years, and that greater than 80% of the graduating residents now pursue fellowships uh, which has become their, 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 their principal interest. And they basically uh, had made the suggestion that they change the five-year model into a three plus three model where, uh, where the first three years is general surgery, then three years is the surgical subspecialty that they are going to eventually uh, go into. This uh, recommendation, uh, however, was, uh, was, was rejected. And what they, they're saying was that these integrated pathways allow a shorter overall training duration and earlier opportunities for more income uh, as a specialist, but it also goes and provides better, uh, better training, including minimally invasive, uh, invasive techniques. So what's happening is, is that, you know, the pushback was, well, if you go through a full residency program, you're more battle tested. But what the, what the, what the, uh, the literature has been showing as the people who have moved to sort of a more integrated model are actually being more successful on most of the things like we heard from Nick, as far as satisfaction, as far as the number of cases they eventually do in the area that they're going to, that they're going to specialize in. So one of the concerns is, is that this general surgery residency, that, that most of the, when you talk to program directors after completion of the residency, about a quarter felt that the new fellows were totally unprepared for the operating room. They were, uh, a quarter of them were unable to recognize even early signs of complications, that almost a third of them were not familiar with the common therapeutic options. More than a third of them demonstrated a lack of patient ownership. Uh, you know, over 50% could not suture, over 66% uh, uh, were deemed unable to operate for 30 unsupervised minutes in any type of uh, major procedure. And this is a really damning situation where, you know, on one hand, they're saying, look, at, we, need to, we need to keep this in. And, and these are things as we as neurosurgeons should learn from to avoid a similar set of, of problems. So what's happening is that the American Board of Surgery now allows some flexibility for blocks where they can go and use that for more subspecialized training in an area of uh, in an area of interest. Now, if you look in because of this 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 lack of having the primary focus being in the the, the subspecialty, there are now a number of integrated programs 
integrated plastic surgery, integrated cardiothoracic surgery, integrated vascular surgery, integrated thoracic surgery. And if you see for what, for what happens, the absolute best and brightest in medical school is going into these integrated, uh, integrated programs. And this just shows, uh, this just shows uh, how, the, uh, how the success is, and this is for cardiothoracic surgery, of these different integrated programs. And Ellen, who gave the generous, uh, generous introduction, is an integrated plastic surgery resident. And clearly, I will tell you, she is one of the best and brightest. Uh, and, and, and it's been said by when I talked to her classmates, why should I spend eight or nine years if I can do it in six years and end up being better trained in the, uh, in, in the end of it? So what's happening is you can look at the, the different objective measures of the people going into the integrated programs, and then it shows that the absolute best and brightest are going into these uh, different, uh, different, uh, different areas. So when we look at neurosurgery, it is one of the longest, uh, longest uh, residency programs. And so what's happening is that there has been some discussion about overall shortening medical training across medicine. And one of the things as we discuss this is that there's ideals of, you know, because of lifelong learning from different other things going on, that the actual time in residency may mean a little bit less than what it meant 20 or 30, uh, 20 or 30 years ago uh, with this. And people like David Klein and others have talked about uh, doing this uh, in, the, uh, in, in the past. So what's happening is that uh, we we are very fortunate uh, to, uh, to 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 be in a situation that we can learn from others, and this is uh, looking at the field of orthopedic surgery. And essentially, now almost a hundred percent of all finishing orthopedic residents are also doing a one or two year fellowship after uh, after completion and then and what's happening is as far as the job market as far as many other things if you're not fellowship trained it becomes very difficult to do it and you can see here that this is shows uh, some more recent data up to about 100 percent of the fellows uh pardon me of, of orthopedic residents are now doing uh now doing a, a fellowship and you can see how uh how orthopedic surgery is becoming increasingly uh sub subspecialized so in the field of neurosurgery, we have a long uh, we have a long training period, okay. But one of the things is is we also have a absolute phenomenal uh, American Board of Neurological uh, Neurological Surgery. I'll get to that. I'm just skipping ahead a couple slides uh, with this. Who have been very thoughtful about uh, about uh, about going what's been going on, and so you can see that the ABNS has been. Uh, thoughtful about this, and I think in particular Fred Meyer, I think it's a picture of Solomon uh, next to a picture of Fred, has been a real advocate for finding ways for people, if we're going to do a seven-year program, to complete the uh, program in that, in that time frame. And because of this, and commencing July 21st of this year, that, uh, that we can now have infolded fellowships uh, with a, a, a couple of exceptions so that people during their PGY seven year can go and get this additional training so that we can complete the entirety of training in a seven year uh, period of, of time. So what this is gonna be able to do is to further unify neurosurgery so that instead of these little slices of the pie, for all of us, what we do is we say, that we are unified. Now, unified doesn't mean that we don't collaborate with other people. This shows the uh, great work of the AANS NPA with the American Spine Registries and Registries for Cerebrovascular, for Parkinson's disease, for functional, uh, uh, for radiosurgery, for tumors. It allows us to be able to collaborate across specialties to treat our patients better, but still keep the core uh, objective of the AANS uh, in the in the center of the uh, the center of the sites. So this is uh, just shows the sites across the country as part of the American Spine Registry effort, showing that it's widespread. It will allow us to teach patients uh, to treat patients better, but also to have a variety of different registry efforts that uh, go across the boundaries and, and truly to have the opportunity of all of our patients. Uh, being able to be uh, analyzed and be treated in a in a in a better uh, a better way.
thing, a little bit of a lag. So it, it also gives individual feedback for each of the uh, each of the individual surgeons. So what happened is, is it's my belief, and to sum this up, is that I feel that we do better as a, as a unified neurosurgery community. And I feel instead of saying, I'm an endovascular surgeon, or I'm a spine surgeon, or I'm a peripheral nerve surgeon, I think that we should all be saying, I am a neurosurgeon, but a neurosurgeon who specializes in this particular area. And I think that we will work better keeping neurosurgery as strong as it possibly can be. It should be strong locally, it should be strong regionally, it should be strong nationally and strong internationally. And I think as we do this, as we say to ourselves, we are neurosurgeons, we are gonna give the best opportunity to treat our patients the best, to be able to interact and to educate and to move our specialty forward. So I want to thank you for the different uh, people that have been within the AANS. As I said, it's an incredible honor. I want to thank particularly John Wilson and Reg Hayde, Kathleen Craig, and the, and the great team that, uh, that the AANS has, uh, has. I want to thank Katie Arico and our wonderful Washington Committee. I will tell you for doing work across a number of specialties, our uh, advocacy efforts are the model for, uh, for medical organizations throughout the world. We, we are so lucky to have that, that, that team, team together. I wanna thank my mentors, colleagues, and coworkers at Duke. It's just a phenomenal place to be uh, working that we're building and doing very enjoyable and fun stuff. And we talk about a vocation. There's a lot of people here that are vocation driven that just makes a pleasure each day to go to work. But the most important thing is, is that I I've said most of this involves an incredible degree of sacrifice. And, you know, I have a fabulous family who you're going to see in a minute, but absolutely none of that would be possible without my wonderful and beautiful wife, Katie. She, uh, she is the rock that holds our family together. Whatever, you know, I'm flitting off this place or that. She's always there for the kids. She has been just, uh, just an enormously uh, supportive uh, person. And I would not have anywhere near the, 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 the blessings I have in my life with, with, without her. And I, I will say, you know, she's a practicing anesthesiologist, but despite that, she always has time for the kids and, and time for the family. And one of the things about it is that, you know, I said to that picture, she's also a fairly, uh, fun-loving individual. This is at a uh, uh, University of Wisconsin football game. She's got the Badger hat out, ready to, uh, to, uh, to, to go. I want to thank, uh, I wanna thank uh, my lovely daughter, Ellen, who did my introduction. She is a, a, a true pleasure. This is uh, one of her, during her senior year, playing uh, lacrosse years ago. And, uh, and I want to thank, uh, I want to thank uh, as well, here we go. Uh, uh, these are these are these are uh, her husband uh, Dylan, uh, uh, our daughter Isabel, our son Christopher, Katie, and I. One of our numerous ski uh, ski vacations. I think that was last Christmas. Uh, this is uh, my uh, my exceptionally talented uh, daughter Bridget, who flew over to uh, to. I'm in Florida right now. Uh, even though the meeting got canceled, she had already made flights, and she and her and her fiance Matthew. Are, uh, are here to support me. They're actually in the room here listening to my talk. And I will tell you how much I love and appreciate uh, Bridget's support and, uh, and, and how Matthew is gonna be a real uh, plus uh, to join the, uh, join, join the family. Uh, here are the kids uh, with Katie. This is a sort of a typical Shaffrey activity. I was probably off at some kind of meeting, but you can see uh, Eleanor and her husband, uh, Christopher, uh, Isabel, and Katie at one of their norm norm normal family activities. Then, uh, then finally, uh, my parents, uh, you know, you can see that I've got the similar hairdo as my dad, uh, but, uh, but my parents are uh, around kicking and have always been very, very supportive. And then lastly, 
I think we're there is our pets. So that the, the, the one the one dog, the, the dachshund that's in the suitcase, uh, because he, he hates Katie to leave, he will sneak into the suitcase hoping they'll get zipped in and taken along. And this is our uh, 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 our daughter Bridget's uh, 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 border collie due to the COVID has not been able to be shipped over. So it's, been, it's, it's sort of our uh, sort of adopted uh, near grandchild. And if you've ever had a border collie, you believe me, they, they're like a, a, an autistic, uh, an autistic three-year-old who's gotten too much sugar. They are very, very energetic and find all sorts of trouble and devilment to get into. So I wanna thank you. It's been such a pleasure. And as I said, I, I really want to emphasize that we as neurosurgeons, you know, we change the world. And I, and I feel that, 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 that us working together is the way that we should be moving forward. And with that, uh, that, with that I think that we can do so much many, so many uh, much better things for our patients. So thank you uh, for the opportunity to give this talk.